<clears throat> well, our speakers have certainly uh, plumbed the nature of Luther's intensity, both theological and personal, and they have begun to catalog the horrors referred to in the title of this session. Projected anger, the dark side of God, suffering, fear. At least those stood out in my mind, along with others in, in, in the course of these presentations. It occurs to me that before I turn the uh, session over to uh, the audience to ask questions, I'd like to ask the panelists if any of them would like to raise questions or comments among themselves to each other that uh, the rest of us will have an opportunity to chew on. Not all at once. Bitte. I, I don't understand the technique. <laughs> Is it? Ah, I think it, that's not. Um, Jim, I had also called a question um, when, when I had my paper about your second question, uh, asking if it wouldn't be possible to speak about grace just starting by grace and mercy of God. And this, is, um, this question was, uh, if I say it so, somehow disappointing for theologians, thinking it would be psychologically very good to start with the bad sides and then coming to the good sides. We, uh, most, uh, or many of us think it is good to preach in this way, uh, to start, uh, to, uh, to say it theologically, with the law and come to the gospel. And uh, as I understand you, you think this uh, is not the way uh, coming into the psychological situation of men in 21st uh, century. Yeah, exactly. That? I yes. mean, I think that, um, that, that, that theologies arise out of and speak to a certain psychological condition. And I think Luther's theology arose out of and spoke very powerfully to a certain psychological condition that um, our, um, our late colleague from Chicago, Heinz Kohut, called Guilty Man. Sorry for the misogyny, but that's, that's Kohut. Um, and, um, but, he you know, but, but he contrasts the, this with, with, a different, with a different sort of self-structure and a different sort of psychological structure, and um, to which that's not as powerful a message, and in which the, the, the sense of the, the, the capacity, which, which is also there in Luther, um, the capacity to identify with a merciful and, and, um, and accepting and empathic God in Christ um, is, is, the, is the, trans, the point of transformation. And that, as a, as a psychologist, and that's the issue that I'm, I'm concerned about. Where's the point of psycho-spiritual transformation? And I don't think, I think for, for fewer and fewer people, it's at the point of the guilty conscience, and it's more and more at the point of what Kohut calls the diffused self. And so even when, and I have, and, 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 and certainly I, I, I see patients like this and, 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 and ministers and pastors report this, that, that, that even when people, you know, people firmly believe that doctrine, it's justification, but it's not really transformative in their experience. And I think one of the reasons is because they're not, they're not experiencing it out of the same sort of psychological context that it originally rose out of and originally spoke to. So, um, but there's still also, I'm not suggesting the issue of the guilty conscience has disappeared. That's part of the issue, it seems to me, of discernment in, at the present, pastoral discernment at the present time. So yes, you, you heard me correctly. And, um, and, and I understand that, I, I mean, I, um, that, that what I'm saying is, is cutting across something that's very, very deep in the Lutheran understanding of theology and, and spirituality and pastoral care. And I somehow want to say, I, I want to do both things. I want to be respectful of that. I don't want to be reductive psychologically, but I do, I am, I was asked to come here and bring a sort of clinical psychological perspective to the discussion. And if I do that, it, it does cut across th that very traditional Lutheran uh, um, formulary of the, of, the, of the spiritual journey of starting with guilt, which, which of course recapitulates Luther's own experience. But I think fewer and fewer people in, in North America, in Europe, in the 21st century, their development doesn't necessarily recapitulate Luther's experience. Freud, interestingly enough, would agree with Luther about this, but um, that's a different story. <laughs> 
Are there other matters that the panelists would like to raise? I'm sort of interested to hear from the audience. All right, then I'll turn to the audience. Christine, do we have anyone with? Uh, we do. Okay. You see the lovely lady with the microphone. Uh, so it, when I call upon you, she will bring the microphone to you. Please uh, identify yourselves when you stand up and ask the question and identify any of the panelists to whom your question is specifically directed. Want to start back there? Sir, she's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm Ron Thiemann from Harvard University. One of the things that the the panel or the, uh, the presentations suggested to me, and I think one of the themes of the conference, is to ask how one appropriates Luther's thought for the contemporary situation. And I think we saw in the presentations the need both to reject and to um, appropriate aspects of Luther's thought. Going to uh, Professor Jones's question about whether or not one can start with the gospel, so to speak, both theologically as well as, um, as, well as uh, psychologically, it seems to me that, that there are ways of appropriating Luther's theology of the cross, which sees it as, if you will, a, a form of spiritual practice. And that if one takes seriously the, the Finnish um, Luther research that we heard a little bit about last night, to recognize that there's a genuinely ontological character in Luther's understanding of transformation. Now, Luther may not himself have mined the full significance of that for his own pastoral theology, but it seems to me we do have in the theology of the cross a way of construing Luther as suggesting that the gospel really does triumph over the law, and while the two remain in some kind of tensed relationship, the gospel is finally God's last word for humanity. And it seemed to me that Jackie Bussey's uh, interpretation of the theolo theology of the cross moves to some degree in that direction. So I'd like Jackie to respond and then uh, see if Jim has a, a further response. Go on, Jack. There you go. Uh, yes, can, can I be heard? I don't know if this is working. Hello. Yes, uh, I guess that I would just say that uh, absolutely. I saw the same theme in all the papers, the rejecting. There's certain things we must re reject as well as appropriate, and I, I really appreciated that. And I thought the papers worked very well together for that reason. And I do think that, that my interpretation of the theology of the cross maybe calls for a kind of a, a different understanding of, that, of a sort of a, it doesn't really give a priority, to, say, to uh, the notion of gospel over law or the wrathful God, a God that we should fear over a God in which we have hope. I, I think my, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is find some kind of both end that maintains that tension um, simul <laughs> constantly and at the same time. So I really appreciated the sort of the reversal because I think it's a good counterbalance to the way maybe we usually think of things. So. Um, I mean, the thing that, again, from a psychological standpoint, the thing that I most appreciate about Luther's theology of the cross is its relentless realism. And, and, and Luther, um, again, in, in a way parallel to Freud, but of course very different, says, I want to take my stand on reality as I know it and experience it. Um, and, and it's that commitment to, to, to take one's stand on reality that, that I think is, is, is very compelling about Luther. Now, he obviously has some very serious blind spots because we all do. I mean, that's part of the human condition. And Krista certainly pointed out many of them in terms of the, 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 the larger social context in which, this, in, in which the reality that Luther wanted to take his stand on takes place. Um, but I, I do think that, that one, certainly one of the ways that, that I think it's, that from a psychological standpoint, that it's impro a, a important to appropriate Luther's theology of the cross is this relentless concern about to take your stand on reality as you know it and experience it and not go into denial because denial from my standpoint denial always does mischief and 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 one of the things that that many of the panelists have talked about is in 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 different ways the way in which luther wanted to cut across any sense of denial now he didn't do it perfectly and and, and none of us do but i i think that's a strong point the, the question about the, the triumph of the gospel, of course, I mean, and the question about hope, I mean, that is a question of hope, and what can we hope for? Um, 
and, and it seems, again, I, I'm, I'm really trying to limit myself to, to, to speaking psychologically, but, w but one of the things, again, that's crucial, that, and the research about this and people have written about this, um, that, that one, of the, one of the major functions of, of, of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis is to restore hope. And, 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 and it turns out there's a whole epidemiology of hope, that both, both psychologically and also physically, also in terms of physical medicine. Hope is a very important thing, and it's that dialectic that I think uh, that, that all of us have been on this panel have been pushing at is how do you have realistic hope? How do you have hope that, that's potent enough that it, that it really serves a transforming and facilitative and supportive function and yet still stays grounded and doesn't achieve liftoff somehow? <laughs> um, and, and that, it seems to me, is a crucial, as, 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 um, as, as Jacqueline said so powerfully, that's a crucial issue in the 21st century. It was also a crucial issue, I suspect, in Luther's time, is how do you have realistic hope, hope that's, that's potent enough to be transformative and yet realistic enough to keep rooted in reality. The gentleman on the aisle with the scarf, uh, right here, right in front of me. I want to thank the panel for a wonderfully uh, complimentary and synergetic uh, uh, panel. I remember a teacher about a half century ago when I was in my studies named Paul Shearer, who was a, a Lutheran pastor, professor, an editor of the Interpreter's Bible who said, God's wrath is God's mercy. God's mercy is God's wrath. And the grace I've received in this panel is the, uh, the similitude of grace and task, of Paul and James, of Luther and Wesley. And uh, I thank you for that. Gentleman with the striped uh, sweater right behind you. Thank you. I'm Bill Russell from Texas Lutheran University in beautiful Seguin, Texas, where it's, where it's 80 degrees right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I didn't anticipate trying to come up with some large synthesis question for the whole panel, but as I each of you spoke, I thought of questions that I wanted to ask you in the hallway, and now I'm stuck here in front of the whole. Uh, group. But I wonder, and so I'll be all synthetic if I can, um, I wonder if Qu Luther's quick move, uh, his easy and decided uh, theodicy, is not partly a result of his intense practicality. In the end, the question of theodicy is uh, not answerable, except to say it's by God's grace, and in the end we can count on that. And why move quickly or maybe even glibly to that conclusion? Luther's practical, and he wants to lay that out and then get about the business of living in a world that's broken and difficult as it comes to us. And his recommendation for that would be a lifelong kind of spirituality. I'm moving down the uh, panel here. A, a spirituality characterized by oratio, meditatio, and tentatio that uh, starts with this question of praying for insight into the word, into the scriptures, and taking the scriptures, as it were, out into the real world in meditation. I think his best explanation of that is in his uh, simple way to pray for a good friend that, uh, that needs to be retranslated. But uh, where he describes a kind of this worldly spirituality uh, piety that uh, for meditation in the world that is, incorporates vocation and service to the neighbor. He's busy. He's practical. He doesn't want to be too flighty about uh, answering questions that people really can't when the world is in such dire need. And uh, when uh, someone goes out into the world t with this praying for insight into the scriptures and the word on their lips, they get smacked down by the devil and the world. This is, I'm speaking in Luther's terms, that's what tentatio is. And that suffering, that pain, drives one back, as it were, to seek insight into the word. This kind of spirituality is more circular or 
maybe spiralish in uh, whichever direction a spiral might need to go as it as it moves from prayer, seeking insight into the word, meditation, and then suffering uh, on fechtungen, and uh, not because it is to save or is to redeem oneself or to justify oneself. And when the medieval system, insofar as it was affirmed by the papacy, that allowed for some kind of self-justification, that is why Luther thought the pope was the Antichrist. So I got them all in there in one. <laughs> and that's, uh, so that's all a comment, and I'd appreciate some uh, clarification from you all. Thank you. Who would like to start? Perhaps I start just with the latest point. Uh, why was the Pope the Antichrist of the papacy? Was the Antichrist the, indeed the uh, uh, focal point of the, it is the kind of self justifying, but the point for Luther to come to his discovering of the papacy as an Antichrist was the question of scripture, of uh, deciding what is possible for men to know about God. And uh, he, uh, he was confronted with people saying uh, it should be the Pope alone deciding what could be Christian doctrine, and, uh, even if based on the scriptures. So I would not take too close uh, those uh, aspects and uh, would not try to um, try, uh, tear all things from those uh, point of self-justifying, there was a lot of different struggles Luther had to fight, and the struggle with the papacy was one, rooted on some hand in the teaching of justification, but rooted also on uh, some parts aside of it. And uh, I think it is very important to distinguish all those different struggles to understand how this very quick development of Luther coming from a star in the old system to a star uh, in opposition of the old system from, uh, let's say, 1515 to 1520, to understand this with all, all those very different struggles. Uh, all the Lutheran theologians in the audience should prepare to, to emit a huge groan at the thought that this clinical psychologist is going to say something about Lutheran theology. <laughs> but um, w one of the things, and, and I thought of this same in the discussion last, I mean, we've touched now, it seems to me, on two problems. Um, the problem of freedom of the will last night with, with, with Professor Hodgson's um, um, lecture, and then the discussion of theodicy here, which, which and I appreciate your question. now. Again, here, here's where you should get ready for the groan, because my, my, my sense in reading Luther, which I hadn't done for a long time and then sort of immersed myself in for the last month and a half, um, the, thanks to a CD Rome that, that, that Christine sent me, that, that he's, not, he's not a systematic theologian. And I think it's a mistake to try to make him into a systematic theologian, groan. Um, he, he, he's, respond, he's, he's a biblical commentator responding to biblical texts, and then he's responding to pastoral crises in the, in the moment of the Reformation, and at least all the, and I certainly didn't read all that stuff, but certainly the stuff that I did read, it, it seemed very much responsive in a good sense, or reactive in a good sense. It, he's not trying to create a, an architectonic theology in, in the style of Schleiermacher or Barth or, or, or something like that. He, he's, so to say, what's the systematic answer to the question of free will in Luther? What's the systematic answer to the question of theodicy? I think is to, is to really ask, I, I apologize for, for saying this kind of point, to ask a sort of wrong-headed question. And I really appreciate your comment, sir, because I think it points out that there really is no intellectual, we don't have the categories to answer these things. And now I want to, and, and this sort of puts back to a, to a, to a comment I guess I had to, uh, to Krista about, it, it seems to me the answer, and, and I, I don't know whether this is Luther's answer or not, but it seems to me the Christian answer to the problem of suffering is that God suffers, that Christ suffers, and that, and, and, and the Christomorphic suffering, yes, can be misused as a rationalization of abuse and oppression, absolutely. But on another level, it, it seems to me it, it it's not just about absence, and, and we, uh, you read Ve much more than I have. I've read very little of Ve, but my experience in reading Ve was that she wasn't just about absence. She was, she was about a kind of paradoxical kind of 
And again, I may be coming from such a different place and projecting it onto her, and, and I, I'm glad to stand corrected, that, that, that there, there's an absence of God, that it, there's an absence that's also a presence, or a presence that's also an absence in, in, the, in, in the process, in, excuse me, in the experience of suffering. Um, and, and, and that's the answer. It's not an intellectual, theological, systematic answer. It's a, it's a practical, experiential, spiritual, psychological answer that, the, that in the midst of suffering, there, there's, there's the absence of God, but there's a paradoxical presence there, or, or, or vice versa. And, and I did get that from Vey, but you stressed the absence so much that I, I did. So I may have misread Vey, and I may need to be corrected by you. That. No, I mean, I think that's a very astute reading of Vey, and this sort of connects to both, both your comments or and your comment also, which is, what I would say is that I think the reason that I, I foregrounded that absence or that um, kind of tenacious, devouring, yeah. voracious yeah, God right. is, um, is partly because I think Vey ultimately, she would sort of agree with you, and this is sort of the sense that I get from Luther too, um, that yes, there is this sense in which the suffering is the contract point that we have with God. So it's an absence, but paradoxically also a presence. The problem is that they would want to sort of say, okay, but stop. Like, she doesn't want to embed, in other words, the whole kind of um, oratio meditatio tentatio formulation, she wants to guard against um, embedding the, um, the tentatio part of it within some kind of overarching narrative where it all will come right in the end and really it feels like absence, but actually it's presence. I mean, I mean, I think her problem, her primary critique, I think, of, of the 20th century, and I think it's apropos to some of the concerns for the 21st century as well, is that we do sort of elide that moment of absence or suffering. We're too quick, in other words, to move to consolation. And so Luther, to me, seems also to be, um, and why I found them such good dialogue partners, also to be wary of this, to yeah. say, look, don't get too quickly to yeah. the consolation yeah. because yeah. then the, the psychological work but also maybe the theological work doesn't get done that needs right. to get done perhaps. And that's exactly how I was going to respond to the question. It, it really ties in well, I think. Because I think you made a point, sir, about that the, the reason why we turn to theodicy or light of grace kind of language is because it's practical on some level. Um, and I guess my, I would like to push you a little further on that and ask the question, practical for whom and when? Because the interesting thing about Luther is that I think there's really, that I found in reading for this was there's times when he thinks that that light of grace language is totally impractical. In particular, I'm thinking of his piece, the devotional piece of consolation to a woman who's had a miscarriage, in which you expect him maybe to take that turn towards that kind of consolation, and he, he does not. He tells the woman, it's completely not your fault. You should, you, and then he turns to the Moses language about sometimes we don't even know what to say but we hope that God hears our cries and that there's some, something in that. And he doesn't, he avoids completely any of the, the light of grace language or any theodicy there at all, any justification for what the mother has gone through. And he does that at several different points in his devotional writings, which I find interesting. Robert, um, down front, and that gives me a chance to ask the panelists, I have water, would any of you like? Do you have it? I have it. I'm okay. Thank Thank you. You. I got it already, thank you. <laughs> Um, my name is Robert Orsi, and I'm here at Northwestern uh, in the religion department. I have a question that addresses what began to seem to me across the four extraordinary papers to be a certain latent but never quite, fu quite surfaced political anxiety about Luther, the sort of unspoken. It gets spoken, but I mean, I think, you know, we want to move beyond the kind of uh, a certain interpretation of Luther. But I recently had the um, experience of teaching in a class, I'm teaching a class this quarter on religion and Christianity and pain. And to do this class, I had, in one of the moments, I had the students look at the Mel Gibson's uh, uh, Passion of the Christ, which is no about nothing uh, than pain. You know, it's this, extended, okay. it's this extended depiction of Christ's pain in a way that, I mean, I think interpreters who say that it, it, it's quite co uh, consonant with the Western tradition, iconic tradition of Christ's suffering is, is right. I mean, there are lots of images of that. But the class is half Jewish and half Christian, and we ultimately couldn't, we couldn't address, I thought, finally, the, the potential, the, the sort of affirmative potentiality of Christ's suffering and death because the Jewish students wouldn't let us in a way, and, and I really respected their anxieties and their concerns. And as a historian, I'm also very aware of the, the ways in which the Christomorphic event has been quite available to political regimes of oppression, as several of you noted. So I guess I'm a little concerned about what seemed to me to be the confidence of all four of you 
that ultimately this event can in fact spring free of its historical usage, uh, its very dark historical usage. And that somehow this event can spring free of its history, which is now from Luther, you know, we have a lot more history uh, in which this event has been, I mean, pain is such an unstable and powerful signifier, and it has been made such political use of in world history. Where is the confidence that that event, that what we see as the transformative potential of that event, and Jim, I was very moved by your presentation of this, but where is the confidence that that can be reclaimed from its political heritage now? Because I looked at the class and I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe it can't happen. Maybe it's just too late in the world's history and memory for this to happen. Well, well Bob, I, Bob. I, I know panelists can speak for themselves, but I, I, I and, and I, I'm, I'm more than glad to stand corrected, as I've said many times. I don't recognize this panel, to be really frank. You, you should know that this guy and I know each other, so we can be frank with each other. We've been around more than one track. Um, uh, I don't recognize this panel in that description. I must say, I think people in the panel, and, and, and my panelists, um, have uh, much more sensitive to this than I was, and I say that quite clearly, to, not to do that and to be very clear about the ambivalences and ambiguities that are involved in, in invoking that. And um, Amb ambiguity and ambivalence still holds out the possibility. <laughs> ambiguity and ambivalence still holds out the possibility of usefulness, right? That somehow, I mean, I got the, I, I take your point. And, and perhaps I'm being tendentious, but there is a way in which you, the, the, the language of struggle presumed in the end, the, cry, the suffering of, uh, that Jesus is suffering as meditated on by Luther is still available as a kind of spiritual resource. Okay. Okay. And what I saw in the class was a, a, a total undermining of that. So that I felt hollow when I tried to say, look, look guys, wait a second. You know, we can interpret Jesus' pain and suffering this way. I kept hearing the Jewish students kept saying, no, you can't. No, you can't. What about this history? And, and I, you know, I heard them. So that's what I'm talking about. In a sense, I'm wondering if the, if the, if the panel's focus on struggle is enough. Okay. I don't know that's much clearer. Thank you. I don't know if that helps to seem less tendentious. You know, that's much clearer. Thank you. I will see you I have only uh, always the easy chance to say I'm not a systematic theologian, <laughs> but a historian. So it's very easy to uh, answer and to say, oh, so uh, I'm, I do just a description. But as a historian, I'm not sure if uh, I would go with you in your analysis. If I, especially as a German historian, look for situations uh, where, now to, to make it very sharp and very clear, where a uh, here a Christ was confronted with a suffering Christ. It was the Kirchenkampf, the Third Reich. There we had a hero Christ with the Deutsche Christen. And the suffering Christ was the Christ spoken out by the Bekende Kirche. So I think there was a lot of power of this suffering Christ against terrorism and uh, against the uh, suppressing politics. So there, just a description as a historian, there's a ground for hope that this yeah. uh, kind uh, of uh, speaking uh, about Christ may be powerful also in politics. Yeah, I, I was recently at a conference on religion and violence, and I heard James Carroll, who wrote the book Constancy's Sword, say to a large, really because it was broadcast all over the world on the internet, say, whenever, whenever the crucifixion is foregrounded, anti-Semitism follows right behind it. And that's certainly in the spirit of what you're saying. But I would also bring forth another historical example, which is the, 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 the Afro-American spiritualities, the civil rights movement, um, that whole movement for, for, for which was powerfully transformative, both personally and culturally. And, and, and how much of the, the hymnology, you know, to say that, and, and the preaching, as, as, as someone who was there and heard it, you know, I mean, very much focused on the cross and on suffering, but used in a very different way. And so I, I just, the, 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 this is just, you know, I mean, this is just, again, to foreground the notion of ambivalence and ambiguity, which, is it enough? I don't know, Bob. I honestly don't know, but I know 
the, 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 I don't know the German example so well as my colleague, but I know the, 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 the Afro-American example. And there, the language of the cross and suffering led to a powerfully transformative movement. And if I could just respond too, to your point, which I think is really powerful. I'm really engaged in Jewish Christian dialogue all the time and have encountered exactly what you said. And I, I guess my, this is you know, undeveloped at this point, but I guess what I would say is if, if there was anything in my talk that, that lent itself towards legitimizing suffering, then I would certainly want to rewrite it. Because my intention is the, exact, is the exact opposite, is really to say that instead of looking at you know, the cross and having this understanding of it as, ooh, it ushers in some kind of great redemption, which of course is the whole problematic in Jewish Christian dialogue about the cross, I want to say it's hideous. Like it, it really, for me, it's just a symbol of unresolved grief. And it really, Luther helps with that when he says, Christ grieves. Plain, simple, like doesn't try to make any easy transition out of it. And so I'm really trying to look at suffering as, as the givenness of suffering rather than that it's an ushering in of a kind of redemption. And so trying to preserve that, see that in a new way. And I mean, I would just sort of echo that, that I mean, as a Catholic feminist theologian, just, I'm, yeah, I'm acutely aware of this problem. And of course, especially working on VA, it's, it's hugely problematic and has to be dealt with. And I'm just not sure that um, there are other options for us if we want to, in other words, we can take these theological symbols and try, as I think Ve was trying to do, to divest them of some of this, um, this kind of power for evil or power for domination that they have had. But that still is going to require a struggle to reinvest them then with something else. And that, that's, I think, just the nature of the kind of systematic thing. And so, so then you have to decide, is it, does a symbol get abandoned or does it get redeemed or uh, reinvested with some kind of other liberative symbolic power. Right. And you have to be care I think, tread carefully, really. Sir, you have the microphone. <laughs> Professor Jones, I am, I am still uh, intrigued by the notion that we might start or re reverse the normal L Lutheran method and, and, and start with the merciful Christ. It seems to me, though, if, if you do that, there still are some presuppositions that happen, because merciful about what? Uh, even though we may not always begin from the position of guilt, we do share the position, the position of brokenness, and uh, you know, every, every single one of us. Um, in my mind, the gospel as good news, uh, good news changes a bad situation. Otherwise, it's just news. Um, are you lonely? There is one who is with you. Um, do you fear death? The gospel has something to say about that. Uh, there is a supportive community that, that, uh, that, that Christ uh, invites you to. Um, it's, it seems really hard to start with the merciful Christ if there's no bad situation. Um, the gospel, uh, then the gospel is, is, is a proclamation about what? Um, what, what makes it good? What makes it good? Well, it, it may be, I mean, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine that there's no bad situation. I mean, look, look, one of the dangers, it's true in physical medicine too, one of the dangers of having a clinical person come and talk <laughs> is that they spend a lot of time with human suffering and, 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 and probably overgeneralize from, you know, the, the experience of patients, and the word patient means someone who suffers, and so to spend a certain amount of time each week in that sort of psychological arm wrestling of doctor and patient in, 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 in psychotherapy focuses one in a certain way. But the, the people are suffering, and, 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 and they don't, I mean, the undercurrent, and again, I, this is, I may be misreading Luther here, and I'm more than glad to stand corrected. I mean, but I had some examples in my paper that I couldn't read from, from his sermons where if the, the, sense in Luther, the sense I get from Luther is if a person, if, if a person doesn't have an uneasy, guilty conscience, then you have to use a rhetorical tour de force to make sure they feel guilty and, sort of, and, you know, and, and, and so then you can then come along and preach the good news to them. And I do think, just from a purely clinical standpoint, that's, a, that's, not, that's pretty destructive. Yeah, but um, you're still beginning. You're still beginning. But all your examples, you see, all your examples, they, all your examples were a person who's lonely, a person who's afraid of death. Nobody needed to remind them that they were lonely. Nobody needed to remind them they were afraid of death. 
nobody you know, needs to remind people that, that, that this is, as Tillich used to say, of the last century, an age of anxiety. And so I'm just, you know, I'm just, well, look, and I get. The point is that you're really not beginning with the merciful Christ. You're oh. still beginning with a different condition. Oh yes, but you, but you, but I'm talking, I'm talking about homiletically, theologically. No, you're not beginning, but, 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 but in where you start to, to, to preach and teach and theologize and speak, um, you, you are, you know, for, you're starting. The person isn't. No, okay, fine. I don't know. And I understand. I knew this was going to, you know. I mean, I just. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I want to give uh, equal time to all parts of the hall. So let's move yeah. over here. This is an open, open question to which I don't know answer myself. One, one impression of, of reading Luther is that he's always very, he has always very massively the code of guilt and merit present. But what is notoriously missing in my view is the code of honor and shame. So he does not speak much of that. And of course, one may explain this lack of honor and shame so somehow that this is just a cultural or somehow superficial code. But uh, elsewhere in Christian tradition, that is in many ways present, including New Testament. And one thing which I have myself been thinking is that, is it so that this massive introspection or self-measurement in conscience causes this guilt and merit, uh, whereas, whereas Luther maybe would need some more extraspection, so reflecting on the kind of social norms of his environment in order to get this uh, honor and shame language is a little bit, this is maybe a little bit criticism of Luther also. And I mean, when Professor Jones was speaking of this anger as a kind of symptom, I'm wondering whether this anger is a symptom of, of depression or whether it can also be a symptom of somehow narcissism or a little bit sociopathy that you are, you are always operating with self-measurement, with guilt and merit and not so much with this honor and shame which connects you with your social environment and expectations. So Luther seems to disregard the expectations of others and in that, that sense, does not pay attention. So this is a little bit laying Luther on the couch also. <laughs> Reactions? Well, those of you who know Luther better than I should respond to this. I mean, does he really disconnect people from community in that way? panel will need time to think that one over. <laughs> uh, anyone in the, this part of the hall before we move back? The gentleman here in the glasses who, who had his hand up? Uh, this row, right? So you, I acknowledge you first and then... Right, what about the far right? Right here. Theodor Dieter, I have two questions um, uh, to Professor Jones. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I think it was a very challenging, interesting uh, uh, presentation. And um, first, an observation, when I attend a Protestant service in Germany, and I have studied Luther before, I regularly uh, have a cultural shock, um, because um, what I read in Luther seems to have simply disappeared. And what I experience in many sermons is precisely what you say, that uh, we hear um, mainly of this, this loving God. But the interesting consequences of this is, as you already yourself indicated, uh, a serious uh, loss of reality. What is that does not have much significance for the lives of the people. And on the other hand, um, um, turning uh, of the understanding of law into pu pure morality. And uh, what we experience is, is uh, uh, a message like Carnegie or so, uh, or uh, Harris, I'm okay, you are okay. Um, and um, I think this is a serious, uh, the serious loss of reality. As I see, it's related to such uh, focusing on what you proposed. And my question would be, how uh, do you think this could this be avoided, if you agree with my description? 
And um, my second question is more uh, on a theoretical level. I think um, we have to distinguish a psychological perspective from a theological perspective. And I would um, ask you how you r relate the two perspectives. Of course, I do not ask you as a psychologist because this would require a meta, meta perspective. But if we have studied uh, Feuerbach and um, we, we know a lot of uh, creating the ideas of God by human interests and so on. But um, my question is, is this the only reality? And of course, as a psychologist, you move in this field. But the theological claim is that there are, and this is again a question of reality, does theology talk about a reality which is not simply um, the product of certain interests or psych psychological conditions? And so I would um, ask you whether there is a theological discourse which cannot be translated one to one into a psychological one, but has to be honored on its, in its own, um, and how then to relate both discourses to each other. Um, I, I had a little section <laughs> of my paper on, on precisely those issues about what, what happens when historical studies and theological studies and psychology intersect and why there's been dissonance and so on and so forth. Um, and, 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 and of course, that's, that's, a, that's a question that's worth volumes, and, um, and I'm not, you know, I, you, I don't want to do it and you don't want to listen to it, so I've got it. <laughs> um, of, of course, look, I, 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 I don't know whether, of, of, of course there's a theological discourse which has an, I, I would say, there's no question there's a theological discourse that has a, that, that, that has an integrity of its own, and that integrity needs to be respected. Um, and the, the, the psycho, for me, the psychological and and the, the psychological question, and I have a whole thing in the paper that I mean, part of it is a contemporary psychoanalysis is not Freud and Jung, so it's much less inclined towards reductionism than than the more classical theories. But uh, I'm just going to have to stipulate that because I we don't have time. Um, this, for me, the psychological question, which I tried to illustrate in the paper with a couple of examples from Luther, is what is it? Given that the theological discourse has a certain integrity, what is it that predisposes certain people to certain kinds of theological discourse and certain ki and other kinds of people to other kinds of theological discourse? And for me, that's the interesting question as someone who both works with religious patients and also teaches religious studies. And, and, and so th th I, I think that question can be asked in a way that does not reduce theology to psychology, but just says, given that there's this discourse here, why is it that some people are attracted to one kind of discourse and another? What, what, the, that clearly is, it seems to me, a psychological question, and it's about motivation and, and so on and so forth. So I think, I think both of these domains have a certain internal uh, integrity of their own, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm well written in the public record at attacking the notion of reductionism. So I won't review all of that. I, I just to say I think we're on the same page about that. Um, I very much appreciate your comment um, ab about because again, I mean I think that we we have this. I would say we have the same problem here. That, that we had when we, do, when, when we talked, when Professor Bousset talked about hope, which is how to maintain both a, 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 redemptive, a, a redemptive message that's still rooted in reality, and, 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 and not, to, not, to, not, to, not to go into denial, which I gather is what, you, what you're talking about there. Um, and it may be, I mean, this, you, you got me thinking on a new line. Um, it may be that one, and again, I, I, I don't know that this will work with Lutheran theology, um, so you'll have to tell me if it does. It, but, but might there be a way, and it's just a question that occurs off the top of my head, might there be a way to reinterpret the law, the, the, the notion of the law in Luther and the law gospel dialectic so that law is not, is, is, not enti is not simply about the guilty conscience, because that's the thing that I'm sort of saying, well, maybe we need to rethink this, at least in certain contexts, again. Not 100%, but, you know. but, but might, we, might we think of that dialectic and might we think of the law as that which keeps 
the discourse rooted in human experience, which is the thing I really want, one of the things I, I, I'm trying to insist on keeping f with Luther is that relentless realism. And is that, that in his cultural context, and I don't mean to be just dismissive about cultural context, I, to me that's not superficial. So if I say there are, is someone who spent some time in Japan, if, 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 we, if we say that there are honor, shame cultures and, and guilt, super ego cultures, to me that's not a superficial thing. That's something that has tentacles in all aspects of human functioning. So I, I, I'm not a person who thinks, well, if it's cultural, then we're just dismissing it. So I would come back to that. Um, in, in Luther's time, the, the stress on law and the guilty conscience was one of the ways in which he kept his theologizing and preaching and pastoring rooted in people's experience. Now, what do we have to do in this culture at this time to keep our pastoring and theologizing and preaching rooted in human experience? That would serve the same function as the law discourse did in Luther, but it might not be so centered on the, on the idea of the guilty conscience. And, um, and maybe that's a way of, of recovering. So maybe I was too quick to, to dismiss the, the, the discourse of the law and rather than thinking, well, maybe there's a way to reframe it in some way that, and recover something that's useful. I, I, do, I, do, I still insist that, that oh, st having to start from a guilty conscience may not be the best starting place at this moment in time, but I may be wrong about that too. Professor Burkhardt. Uh, yes, uh, several times, uh, Peter Burger at Harvard University, um, and uh, a question from uh, someone who uh, actually has nothing to do with theology whatsoever or, or uh, with uh, religious studies, except that I'm here today to give a talk about a Luther text, <laughs> the, um, about a text by Luther. Uh, but I'm, I've been wondering, uh, Professor Jones, uh, about the, uh, this emphasis on realism, and it's not clear to me as someone who works on literature and art, uh, what you mean, uh, and also psychoanalysis, uh, but what you mean uh, by realism in this context. Uh, where is the realism in psychoanalysis? Uh, where is the, um, uh, I don't take realism to be an ideal, actually, but the, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, where is the realism in, in that, and where is the realism in Luther with his, uh, uh, with his emphasis on scripture? Uh, and, um, and how do you connect those two realisms, or do you? I wish some of my panelists would go. Yeah. <laughs> look, I think, no, I think, no, no, look, I mean, I look, I think, The realism in psychoanalysis, and, and I, I, the realism in psychoanalysis to, for me is that it's rooted in, that it's a clinical discipline, and it's rooted in the suffering of people who come to see one. In, you know, and, um, and, and something happens. When, when psychoanalytic theory gets uprooted out of that clinical context and moved over into departments in the humanities and used as a hermeneutic for, for, for the interpretation of historical and literary texts. Um, and, and I'm not at all suggesting that there's something illicit about that. Obviously there's not. But it does, it, it is a shift of context which I think needs to be acknowledged when it happens. So when I think of the realism the, the, the realism of psychoanalysis, it's the realism that continually, for me, as, as someone who's both an academic and a, and, and, a, and a therapist, it's that it's continually tested back, related back to individuals in distress. Um, can, I, can I just interject? Something? Sure, of course. No, no. I would be surprised if I, you didn't. <laughs> Excuse me. I apologize. Uh, yes, I would say rooted in real experience yeah. and with application to the real world, the real problems of real people, right? But the link between where the theory comes from and the application of the theory is a link that is itself not very grounded in realism insofar as it is grounded in interpretation and an interpretation of things uh, that one often would not consider to be uh, of uh, uh, the real everyday 
world. So that uh, so there's connection at the beginning and the end to, uh, to the real, but uh, but the theory itself, psychoanalytic theory itself, uh, is not a realistic theory or a theory of well, realism. I, 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 I disagree with that, but I because I think th that and 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 that I mean that's why that's why there's actually I mean. That's why there's development. I won't certainly use the word progress, but that's why there's development in psychoanalytic theory, and that's why psychoanalysis today, the clinical practice of psychoanalysis today, is not Freud and Jung, precisely because many of the constructs of Freud, particularly Freud, did not match well with people's, with, with, with patients' actual experience. And there's a continual revision of theory. And if one goes to psychoanalytic conferences, particularly clinically oriented conferences, you can hear that going on. And I think there is, in fact, a process of checking and, um, and verification and so on and so forth, but that's to get off into issues of philosophy of science. Of yeah, exactly. No, we can talk about that. I, and, and, and I would say the same thing, um, and, and I, I, here I hope my, some of my colleagues will, you know, I would say exactly this, you talk about scripture, but again, it, it, it's not just that for Luther, I assume, and, and certainly, the, 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 for Luther, the scripture is not just something for academic um, commentary, the scripture is something that is to be used again, uh, we can agree or not with whether this is good or whether he does it well or so on and so forth, but again, the, 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 the mentality is that the scripture is to be used for preaching, it's to be used for counseling, it's to, again to be used in dialogue with, with uh, people who are in distress. Um, and, and so, again, I think there, there's a, there, there's a this, there's a little disjuncture between the, the academic study of scripture, just like there's a disjuncture between the academic study of psychoanalysis and the, and the praxis of, the practical lived praxis of religion, uh, Lutheran or otherwise, and, and, and the actual praxis of, of psychoanalysis or psychotherapy. And, and that's, I think, part of what's a, a little bit at issue in this discussion. Gentleman in the back row with the striped tie. I got yes, I'm Ron Ritkers. I teach at Valparaiso University. Um, I have a comment for Professor Jones and then a question for another panelist, if, <laughs> if I may. Bonkers. Bonkers. Professor Jones is greatly relieved by the second part of what you said. Exactly right. Bonkers. The question, uh, the, the, com the brief comment had to do with your, your third question about the role of uh, spiritual practices or spiritual discipline. Yeah, yeah. And, and how uh, in Lutheran spirituality you can avoid what Luther would have called works righteousness yeah. and in a way that you kind of live into this justification yeah. by faith. I think for Luther the answer was private confession, <coughs> um, which as a therapist you might find uh, interesting. Um, this is a practice that, you know, maybe it didn't work for him, but he returned to this again and again and again as the way to apply the gospel to his troubled conscience and recommended it for others. Um, now the question is for, for Professor Bussey. Um, I was struck between uh, the connection you made uh, between the kind of hope that you think the global Christian needs to offer or needs to hold and lament, lament and hope. And you seem to have suggested that a crucial ingredient in this hope is a very robust theology of lament. Um, and you seem to find resources for that theology of lament, of lament in Luther. Um, and I wonder if you could say more about that. Because it seems to me that Luther comes close to a theology of lament, of the kind one might find in the Psalms, where people raise their fists at God and say, you're not doing your job. Exactly. Uh, sort of modern paraphrase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, where the hell are you? Maybe <laughs> put, yeah. put a sharper uh, corner on it. Um, um, I don't see Luther going that far, even in the Operaciones, even in the lectures in the Psalms, 1519 to 21. And so my question is, it's about this appropriation for Luther, of Luther for the global context. Do we need to get beyond Luther? Or is he one step along the way in a robust theology of lament? Oswald Bayer has written on this. He has a, a, a brief article called Toward a Theology of Lament. And I have read that. Yeah, so that, that, that's my question. Uh -huh. Well, you, you have understood me. I really do think that hope is grounded in a very robust theology of lament. And I, I think that it is fair to say that that's, that's where I take Luther. I mean, that's really, I'm taking Luther one step beyond where he actually goes. But I feel that, you know, in all fairness, I learned that from Luther somehow. Have I taken him a step beyond where he actually is? Uh, I think I would agree with you. 
I think that I was trying to find language, and this comes back to Bob's earlier question, I think I was trying to find some kind of language that looks at suffering differently, rather than as a justification um, for imperiousness or uh, some future redemption. Or, and I think lament was the word that I found. It's not really a word that, that Luther's using, although Luther says that you know, the Psalms are his favorite book. And, and, and in my head, it's like, well, why? You know, why, why is that the case for you? And I think it's, 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 it's honesty. I mean, I, I just find something so refreshing in Luther, his theological honesty. And so I'm trying, I'm, I, that's a direction I take. Lament for Luther in, in the book of the Psalms. I think there's, I mean, in my longer paper, I have some more specific references. But, and then also, again, I'll come back again to, to the piece I mentioned earlier about the, about the miscarriage. Yes, I, I, think that it, I think that in that piece in particular, it is a lament. Uh, many people have interpreted that piece actually to be about a stillborn child instead of a miscarriage. And it's, I think that is a, his response to that is, is a piece of lament. I, I actually do. Uh, I'm Christy Traina from Northwestern, and as someone who works on contemporary thought and has read in Luther, the comments and the question I have may be too facile, and so I hope that I will be corrected if, if they are. First, in response to the whole discussion about suffering, I think it matters intensely who is recommending that we identify with the crucified Christ, and whether it's being recommended to us or whether we come to it on our own. So I think power is essential in that. Um, but my second question is this. It seems as though, and I would be just fine if Dr. Jones didn't respond to this question, although he's welcome to. It seemed as though there was an underlying, uh, underneath everyone's talks, I heard at some point um, this sense, that we do not have an adequate language for suffering, that we do not have enough words for it. Because there's a very great difference between the kind of suffering that's caused by political or economic oppression and the kind of suffering that we go through, for want of a better word, developmentally or in the act of being liberated. For instance, I think feminist theology is, is still working on having enough language for this. Um, if one is delivered from um, an unwanted pregnancy by an abortion, that does not mean one doesn't suffer. If one is delivered from an abusive marriage, that doesn't mean one is not suffering. One is being delivered into suffering and loss, even by being delivered out of the marriage. So I wonder if there are contributions that Luther can make for rounding out or making more robust our language or our understanding of suffering in a theological and experiential sense. I think at this point we should be very careful not to to ask Luther for all to help us. <laughs> so uh, he speaks for his time, and uh, after long thinking about it, I can take this also to answer to Risto's uh, question uh, half an hour ago. Um, to he spoke on one hand that this can help us. Uh, exactly without any social context. Uh, this, I think, uh, is why he didn't spoke about Hannah and Shane, and why he spoke uh, about the inner man, and uh, about what he saw um, as, as so important for the inner human being. And psychologically, we can think uh, if this uh, still is the right point to understand uh, why, uh, the, the inner human being, I'm more optimistic to think that Luther has seen something what can also be uh, possibly in the 21st century, but concerning the exterior suffering, also combined with inner suffering, but the inner suffering depending on the exterior suffering, all what we can learn from Luther is to look on our, our time and to understand this time as exactly and uh, as uh, open-minded uh, as uh, ever possible and really to find the new concepts of our, our time. Uh, I think we don't go away from Luther if we find the new words for uh, what you are describing. 
I think what I, what I would say, if I may, is that um, I think where Luther is maybe less helpful is in your first comment on power. He seems not, I, I kept looking for or seeking some place where he acknowledged um, the ways in which power affects the kinds of suffering that, that, that's taking place and who's suffering and where that suffering's coming from. But where I think he may be helpful even today is um, how aware he is of its destructive capacity, of suffering's destructive capacity. So very astute and profound, I think. Um, so, you know, he does have kind of these moments of snappy theodicy, um, as Jackie said, but, but I think he also does have a real profound sense of how destructive, how damaging, how um, depersonalizing in some ways it can be. So, so I think he, he fails us a little bit as 21st century thinkers on the, the power dynamic within suffering, but is helpful in that, um, that point of its destructive capacity, and then prophetically what we need to do about that, I think. Yeah, I agree with Chris on that. I just wanted to point out that, what, can you hear me? I don't know if you can. But what I really appreciated about your point was how, how you highlighted um, something that I've learned from Holocaust studies and have written a lot about, which is that, that suffering ruptures language. And you have a crisis of representation um, in the face of, of the kind of you know, radical suffering that people experience. And so I, I appreciated that you brought that out because I feel like that is why I tried to speak about hope as an interrupted discourse. Hope is something that Luther does acknowledge in that Moses passage that I was talking about, that Moses can't actually, he doesn't actually say anything. That sometimes it's, and that's what I was using for the source of the lament, that sometimes, it, and he uses Romans, you know, that it's just some, sometimes it's just sighs and groans too deep for words. And he seems, to val he seems to value that and place a high value on that sometimes that's as far as we can go with people. And so I think keep, keeping that in mind that both hope and lament ha have an acknowledgement of the crisis of representation and that they want to say, sometimes all I have is tears, sometimes all I have is laughter, sometimes all I have is uh, accompaniment with you. Um, and there's, these are all signs, I think, of a solidarity culture. But so I, I really appreciate your point, actually. And I, th and I think Luther's actually helped me to acknowledge that that is, that is something we experience in the face of suffering. And uh, actually, in one time, one of his letters, the letter to a depressed friend, where his friend is writing to him and saying, you know, oh, and he's a pastor, what should I do? You know, I'm so depressed. And, and Luther says, well, you know, sometimes I honor God in the same way. You know, I basically stomp through my house in a rage, yelling. Um, he doesn't say what he says, but he says, he says I just honor God with my murmurings. Because he doesn't even know, like, where he's so mad. And he says, you know, you know, I don't even know what to do. I, and, he, and then he says something like, I don't know whether I'm wrong or God's wrong in those situations. <laughs> so... <laughs> Gentleman right here. I first uh, have a small comment on this debate. Uh, I, I have the feeling or the impression that one should differentiate more clearly between suffering and all negative self-relations. We are in like bad conscience or shame or something like that. And probably not always sufferings are a uh, subject of religious activities. Uh, because as you already mentioned, uh, sufferings are quite often subject to medicine or somebody else. Uh, my question is now coming, mainly referring to uh, Krista's um, paper, uh, coming back to the question of the structure of the religious self-consciousness. Um, and I wonder if the description is right in drawing that strongly on the concept of suffering, and, or if it might give a bit of wrong light on the whole uh, religious consciousness, as le at least as losers constructed it. Um, because now in bringing in uh, Simone Weil and probably with her a lot of existentialist thinking about the human self, um, you, you have, a, I think, or uh, that's my question, probably a different uh, way of use of suffering for the deconstructing and reconstructing their own self. Uh, because in suffering, the function there is suffering is the point where we can we come really to ex to the existence of a person beyond all theories and definitions we make of ourselves. So we d we are there um, at the breath of life in a certain sense and the breath of one, one's own individual life. And in in um, Luther, I think suffering can't be thought about uh, without the other side of overcoming. Um, uh, suffering, and I haven't heard much about that moment or that element in the structure of religious uh, consciousness, which is the other side. And one of the famous uh, songs of Luther, uh, it's in German, I don't know the English uh, translation, Nun freut euch liebe Christen gemein, 
rejoice, dear Christians, or something like that might be, um, very much emphasizes the concept of joy for Christian existence and also for Christian consciousness. So I wonder, well, uh, and I have a, I have a, a suspicion, I, t I tell you the suspicion behind this, I have the suspicion that in Lutheran theology there's a lot of fixation um, for the sake of the sense of reality or something like that, fixation on suffering and the overlooking of joy, overcoming suffering, and also, I think, uh, a lack of, of hope. And if you look, I have to deal with uh, worldwide Christianity a lot. If you look on that scenery, I, I tell you, in my impression, Lutheran um, theology has lost the sense for hope, and this whole element of hope has gone mainly to Pentecostals and charismatic theologies who have ways and found forms of spirituality to express hope, very concrete hope for lives of people. And in the Lutheran structure of the religious consciousness, you have this very strong sense for always the reality and the suffering and the negative side. So even if you are telling them of salvation and so on, you still have to stick to this very strong sense to the negative side of life. And you can't have, uh, you have no integration of um, the joy Luther actually was singing about in his songs. Thank you very much for, for that question, which is, is astute. I think um, I, I definitely would, would um, say that in my paper, I certainly focused on the, the kind of deconstructive aspect or the, the negative aspect, if you will, um, the kind of unmaking of the self rather than the kind of joyful or hope-filled um, obverse side of that. But I, I, I mean, I certainly don't know Luther nearly as well as you do, but I do think that I, I saw that the, the joy side is also the clearly there in Luther. It's there, um, it, it's woven in, in throughout his life where he talks about those consolations and those joys. Um, but I think in terms of this question about the, the structures of religious self-consciousness, I, I perhaps overstated my case if, um, if I have created the impression that I think it's an either or kind of uh, question, that either you've got the, the suffering piece and the deconstructive piece or you get the joy and the reconstructive piece. Um, rather, I think that they, they do have to work in tandem and that Luther has got, in some sense, right, this oscillation uh, between the two, that life will be, will be part of that. Um, and I think what I would say then is that, um, I think was it um, um, Professor Lippmann was talking about the kind of, um, uh, the, the foreground and the background um, context. I think in some senses I'm foregrounding the one and backgrounding the other, but I hope I'm not doing so at the complete expense of, of the, the other side. And the reason I chose to foreground the suffering side is that I wanted actually to call attention to um, Luther and to Bay too, their attempt to stop us short of kind of transforming everything into a happy ending without taking seriously the presence of, of the suffering. Um, that it, it's, we often as Christians are in fact too quick to move to the joy um, and too quick to move to the kind of resurrection without paying enough attention to the crucifixions that are happening around us all the time. But I, I, I don't at all mean to say that the, the joy is not an integral part of, of Lutheran theology and of the religious self-consciousness. And that will have to be the last word. Um, I, I, one of the measures of the success of any academic panel is the energy it unleashes in an audience. And your questions have shown that this was indeed a very successful panel. Please join me in thanking the participants.